Welcome to the UN Network for Scaling Up Nutrition webinar, Fill the Nutrient Gaps, Identifying Context-Specific Solutions to Improve Nutrition Across Food, Health, and Social Protection Systems. This is the second in a new UN Network for Sun webinar series, which is done in collaboration with the Secure Nutrition Knowledge Platform managed by the World Bank Group. My name is Aaron Buxbaum. I'm the manager of the Secure Nutrition Platform. This webinar is taking place on an application called WebEx, and I will describe a few features before the presenters begin. If you can hear me now, no action is needed. To connect your audio, please use the audio menu near the very top of your screen. When you select Connect My Audio, you will see a box with three options appear. Most people select to connect using their computer, which is at the bottom. You may also use a phone to call into the meeting, you will click the middle option and call a phone number indicated on your screen. If you're having trouble to connect on your computer, we suggest closing the WebEx application and simply joining again. If you continue to encounter difficulties, please note we are recording the entire session and we will share this recording and the slides with you afterwards. Again, if you hear me speaking now, you do not need to take any further action. Please also use the chat box to introduce yourself and, importantly, to ask questions. To open the chat box, please look near the top of your screen for a chat icon. Click on that, and you will see a new chat window open near the bottom of your screen towards the right. If you select everyone, you may send a question or say hello. You can also select host or my colleague Laura Figazzolo if you are having technical problems. We will try our best. To assist you. This webinar will run for approximately one hour and 30 minutes. Please ask questions in the chat box throughout, and the presenters will answer these near the end of the session. It is now my pleasure to introduce Nicolas Bidon, who is the moderator for this session. Nicolas is currently the acting global coordinator of the UN Network for Sun and Reach Secretariat, which is hosted by WSP in Rome. He has previously worked with UNICEF, UNAIDS, and WFP, and he holds a PhD from the University of Minnesota in the United States. Nicolas, if you would come off mute, and please go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction, and welcome to all the participants to this webinar. As Aaron uh, mentioned, it is organized by the UN Network for Sun in collaboration with Secure Nutrition. And I want to take the opportunity to thank our colleagues at Secure Nutrition for the excellent collaboration. This webinar is the second webinar of the series of webinars organized by the UN Network for Sun. The focus of the day presentation is Fill the Nutrient Gap, and it is presented by our partner agencies, World Food Program, one of the agencies of the UN Network for Sun. So let me first introduce our presenter for today. We have two presenters, Saskia Depe and Indira Bose. Saskia Depe leads the Fear the Nutrient Gap team. Um, she has worked in international nutrition for 20 years, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience, ranging from research to implementation, collaborating with partners from governments, UN, NGOs, and the private sector. She is also an adjunct associate professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, Tufts University and Wageningen University, and has co-authored more than 150 scientific publications. Prior to joining WFP in 2007, she worked for Ellen Keller International for 10 years, and she holds a PhD in human nutrition from Wageningen University. Our second presenter is Indira Bose, India has been working in Fear the Nutrient Gap team in Rome since 2015, and she has herself conducted the FNG analysis in over eight countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And she has also helped to refine the methods of the FNG process, in particular the quantitative element. She also supports the FNG training and helps to oversee and provide technical support to countries conducting or planning cost of diet analysis. 
prior to working at the World Food Programme. India has worked on a number of research projects and evaluations related to nutrition and food security in different countries, such as Ghana and Myanmar. She holds an MPA in Development Practice from Columbia University and a BSc from the London School of Economics. Um, um, now, um, in terms of the floor, you will have about half an hour to 40 minutes presentation, starting with Saskia and followed by Indira, and they will be, this will be followed by questions. As uh, Aaron pointed out, you can log in your question in the chat box and it will be taken at the end of the, present, uh, the presentation. So let me now pass the mic to Saskia, who will start the presentation. Saskia, over to you. Saskia, over to you. I believe you're on mute, Saskia. Ah, sorry. I clicked the wrong button for unmute. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased with this uh, opportunity to present uh, to you the field of region gap. Uh, it's been developed by uh, WSP and partners, um, and it's about to inform national policies and programs for improving nutrition. Um, I hope we're able to see the slides, and I don't see them yet myself. Uh, so let me begin. So the field of nutrient gap analysis um, is really um, to inform, um, you know, uh, to inform governments. Hi, Saskia. Just a moment. This is Aaron again. Just to let you know that we cannot see the slides yet. Uh, if you could click around to share your screen or to share the presentation, I think that will help everybody out. You're being they should be shared by Indira, Erin. Have you given her the uh, rights to present? All right, I'll go ahead and allow Indira to share. All right, thank you very much both. Perfect. Okay, great. So you can go to the next slide. So what we'll do in this presentation, we'll share you uh, the approach of the field of nutrient gap analysis and we'll share uh, examples from uh, different countries where we've conducted it. It's really uh, to provide you a snapshot of what the uh, field of nutrient gap analysis can do. Uh, and also to provide you uh, yeah, examples from a number of countries, but of also in this part we're far from uh, exhaustive. Um, so SDG2 is the, the key here, and in particular ending all forms of malnutrition. If we go to the next slide, um, we have the uh, Lancet framework uh, with the different nutrition-specific interventions, nutrition-sensitive uh, interventions. And uh, the key really is to select uh, those approaches that uh, are most appropriate for countries' context. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, what the field of nutrient gap uh, analysis is about is really about uh, tuning in, on the next slide please, the inadequate uh, dietary intake. So there's two direct causes of malnutrition. It's inadequate dietary intake and disease. Uh, and what we do with the analysis is that we unpack um, the inadequate dietary intake part of the framework. So the different uh, underlying and basic causes that ultimately um, affect dietary intake and dietary intake of uh, different target groups in the population. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, 
adequate nutrition is about consuming 40 nutrients in different amounts. Uh, those need to come from a right, for, wide variety of foods. And those amounts, uh, they also differ for different target groups. So we'll show on the next slide. Uh, if we, for example, compare a, uh, a young breastfed child to an adult man, uh, their body weight uh, differs by a factor 10. However, their required iron intake only differs by a factor one and a half. Um, and the amount of uh, food that you provide, uh, the required kind of amount of iron, is also very different. Uh, um, for the child, um, the breast milk is not a very good source. Um, so by the age of six months, when the stores that have been laid down um, during pregnancy have been exhausted, and they've all been used, uh, the complementary foods you provide the iron that the child needs, uh, most of it. Um, so that means that 200 kilocalories should provide 9 milligrams. And this means that in 100 kilocalories of food, the child needs 4.5 milligrams of iron, whereas the adult man needs a half. So there's a factor 9 um, difference. So the child needs a much smaller portion of food, but in that smaller portion of food, there should be a higher concentration um, of iron. Um, similarly for zinc, there's a factor of three difference. So when we zoom in uh, on this aspect of the nutrient requirements, we must be quite um, have enough eye to detail in the sense that our different target groups um, have different needs. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we're showing you the partners with whom we have developed uh, the fill the nutrient gap uh, approach, situation analysis and decision making. Um, we have uh, UNICEF, IFPRI, Epicentre in Paris, uh, Harvard University, Mahidol University, as well as uh, University of California in Davis. Um, and we have uh, on this slide, we're showing you uh, two key donors um, to this, uh, Global Affairs Canada, um, who really stood at the, the basis of the development of the uh, approach and uh, DMZ from Germany, uh, who's really uh, key in um, providing us uh, a maintenance funds um, now and uh, for another uh, one or two years. Um, and there's actually many more donors um, as countries fund the uh, analysis in their own country. So in different countries, different donors help um, to support uh, that the analysis can be conducted. On the next slide, uh, we're showing you uh, where the analyses have been conducted so far. We started with three pilots in El Salvador, Ghana, and Madagascar. Um, and by now, we've, uh, we have or we are working in another seven. Um, and there's also a number of countries where we have just uh, conducted the cost of the diet analysis. And we'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, and those countries, they may proceed to do a, a full uh, field and region cap analysis. Uh, and we're also showing the, uh, the countries uh, that are interested in conducting the analysis and with whom we are currently in the planning uh, stages. So on the next one, you see the, the primary goals of the field and region gap uh, analysis. It's really to strengthen the nutrition analysis uh, in such a way that it links to decision making. And it links to decision making uh, in a multi-sectoral um, setting. So we really want to have this, this situation analysis lead to an understanding and a shared consensus on what are cost-effective policy and programmatic strategies in order to improve nutrition of key target groups in the particular context. And as we show you the examples, we'll, yeah, we'll share how we actually go about it. That is really about analyzing um, access to nutritious foods, availability of nutritious foods, uh, the role of uh, affordability of such foods, so that uh, ultimately, based on the situation analysis, different sectors are able to identify um, where they can assist. So which nutrition sensitive or nutrition specific uh, interventions can be implemented. Uh, on the next slide, uh, this goes more into the, uh, the components of the analysis. 
So what we do, we review secondary data and sources of information. Uh, and this can be a large amount of um, information. We'll share that with you some examples as well. Um, so it's about analyzing existing data sets and it's about reviewing published uh, reports, it can be gray literature, scientific articles, um, and so on. Um, and the other component is that uh, cost of the diet, linear programming. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that on one of the next slides. Um, it's really uh, taking a life cycle approach. So we want to um, look at um, everyone meeting their nutrient requirements. Um, and the focus of the analysis uh, is decided in country. Um, and typically, uh, we'll look at the, the thousand day window um, as well as at adolescent girls. So the next slide shows uh, more about the cost of the diet. Uh, cost of the diet is a, a software that's been developed by uh, Save the Children. Uh, and we use it to determine the least expensive uh, combination of nutritious foods um, that can meet nutrient requirements based on the local foods. So it starts with um, you know, which foods are locally available with a listing of that um, and with their prices. And then the linear programming tool will make selections of foods that meet the nutrient requirements of a household. And we then specify what the household, uh, who the members are. So typically we have a breastfed child uh, of about one year old, um, a lactating woman, uh, an adult man, uh, a school going child and an adolescent girl. Um, so then the tool will select um, you know, which combination of foods can meet the RNI of each individual at the lowest cost. Um, and the only thing that we force the tool to select um, is the local staple. So there should be two servings of the local staple in the diet. Uh, and we call that the staple adjusted nutritious diet. So the, that abbreviation is not, if you see it in the slides coming, that's what it means. Um, now, uh, now a few things about the process. Um, so the tool has been developed to facilitate uh, national level processes and decision making. Um, so it's really about involving all the key stakeholders in country. Um, so there is a country team uh, for the field and nutrient gap that is supported by our field and nutrient gap team from WFP in uh, Rome. Um, and usually um, we have different setups, um, but it, uh, the key champion in country can be from uh, can be the sun coordinator in country, uh, can be uh, the nutrition uh, focal point, can be the social protection uh, mechanism. It, it really depends how the analysis will be used, who champions the analysis in country, and who uh, is involved in the core group to lead the analysis. Uh, so from national government, you can see the different sectors uh, that are to be involved. Um, from WSP, we involve um, both country office, um, regional bureau, and headquarters. Uh, other UN agencies are involved, um, as well as other partners. And, um, on the next slide, we, we show you the process, um, but the process is always tailored to the specific country. So depending on the, the platforms that exist uh, in country, if the full SUN uh, networks uh, exist, then that is the, the, the obvious mechanism to, to work through. Um, if there's other mechanisms, um, you know, it can be tailored to that. So um, the government or the national sun coordinator really takes the leadership. Um, at the start of the process, the focus is defined through a multi-stakeholder uh, inception meeting. Um, and there can also be an, a sensitization um, edit or before that, uh, such as this webinar or a similar webinar just for the country. Um, and in that uh, first phase, uh, the stakeholders achieve uh, consensus on the key target groups of focus and the level of analysis uh, with that meaning um, you know which regions of the country are most of interest uh, on which regions are data available that will determine how the analysis can be focused um, then uh, the large part is the analysis 
and the analysis, uh, the cost of diet is a key component there. Uh, there will be training for how to do it. Um, and as you saw from that slide on cost of the diet, we need food price data. Uh, food price data may come from uh, secondary sources, uh, such as uh, national household expenditure surveys or uh, food price monitoring data, if they are uh, elaborate enough. So they should have information about 60 to 80 uh, food items at least. So if that is available, that can be used. Um, if that's not available, then there should be food price uh, data collection in markets. So that would need to be organized. Uh, the other part is that secondary data compilation component and the analysis of that. Um, and then the cost of diet analysis should take place and there will be modeling uh, for different scenarios with that. Um, and Indira will share with you uh, what that is like. Uh, based on that uh, analysis, which is uh, done some uh, behind uh, the desk and then uh, it's an iterative process uh, with the, the champions uh, in country to go for the, uh, how the analysis proceeds, what insights uh, come from that, whether there's um, gaps or additional information that can be fitted in, uh, which modeling uh, to do. Um, when that process is completed, uh, there is a national multi-stakeholder workshop in which those findings um, that have been verified with the key technical partners in country are shared. Um, and then there is a joint identification of potential strategies to fill the need in the gap uh, across multiple sectors. We go to the next slide. Uh, this shows you how uh, the results have been used in pilot countries. Um, so, in, uh, and this is an example, but by now we have used it uh, or have gone through the full phase in another about six countries, um, but they have used it very similarly. Um, in El Salvador, the aim was really to redesign the government social protection strategies. That was the ministry that was uh, fully engaged uh, throughout the process uh, and who has since taken steps to implement um, the recommendations that were formulated. Uh, in Ghana, the process really led to active engagement of stakeholders across different sectors. Uh, I mean, some work on that had started, but um, they really needed uh, a push uh, and, and a focus. Um, so that was what uh, the field nutrient gap analysis uh, helped to achieve. Um, and in Madagascar, the uh, analysis was done at the moment of the design of the new national nutrition policy and its action plan. So through the analysis that really informed the formulation of the policy. Um, besides the, the national uh, purposes, uh, the field nutrient gap also informs um, WFP's own strategic planning process. Um, so some of you will be aware of our singer, zero hunger strategic reviews and the country's strategic plans that are formulated based on that. Um, so when the FNG is done, at, when that process is ongoing, it will also inform uh, how WFP best engages in the country on uh, nutrition. Uh, but we also find that in countries, uh, the, the analysis of the FNG can also be very helpful to further flesh out uh, a policy that may have just been accepted, just its implementation just starting. So ideally, it is conducted when national policies are being revised and country strategies are being designed, uh, but it can also help further down the line, um, especially on further fleshing out uh, nutrition sensitive uh, components. Um, on the next slide, uh, we're sharing with you the, you know, that we have many data sources that are being reviewed. Uh, you see the data categories uh, listed here. Uh, so we'll be looking for sources of information that speak to those different uh, data categories. And they can come from uh, very different uh, sources. And one of the strengths of the analysis is really in the triangulation uh, that can be done uh, by looking at data from very different um, sources and different uh, ways to look um, at a specific issue. 
uh, and we'll give you a bit of a sort of a glimpse of that uh, as we go through the key findings. So here, I'd like to hand it over to Indira. Thank you, Saskia. Uh, before we move to uh, Indira's presentation, I just wanted to remind the audience, please uh, type your questions in the chat box. Uh, and as I saw a message coming from Aaron, re uh, remember to choose everyone uh, to send to so everyone, everyone can see the questions. Thank you. Uh, now to back to Indira, please. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so I'm going to go through some examples of the key findings. So for each country, we have quite lengthy presentations and reports that goes through each of the different barriers to adequate nutrient intake, looking at the insights from secondary data and from linear programming. Um, but as we don't have time for all of that here, um, we're just giving you a few examples from some countries to just give you a taste of the analysis. So this is an example from Madagascar. And here you can see from the, co the cost of diet analysis, the daily cost of a diet that only meets energy, energy needs, and that's in orange, and the daily cost of a nutritious diet that meets, the nutri that meets all of the household's nutrient needs, and that's the blue bars. And this diet meets all of the needs for energy, protein, fat, nine vitamins, and four min minerals for each of the household members. As you can see across the country, the cost of a nutritious diet is almost double that to meet, the, meet only the energy needs. And that, that shows, as Saskia was mentioning earlier, how much more difficult it is to obtain a nutritious diet compared to a diet that only meets energy needs. Now this in itself shows us a little bit about the access to nutrients, but it becomes a lot more meaningful when we compare that to expenditure to really understand what portion of the population may or may not be able to afford a nutritious diet. So here's an example from Tanzania, where we look at what portion of the population in each region cannot afford a diet that meets only energy needs. Here you can already see about 20% of households nationally cannot afford a diet that only meets energy needs. And it really varies according to each region. There are some regions, as you can see in the kind of light pink areas, which pretty much all, everyone, less than 5% of people cannot afford a diet that only meets energy needs. However, there's some areas, like down in the south, Matwara, where we found over 35% of people could not meet a diet that only met energy needs. Now, when we think about a diet that meets all of the nutrient needs, it's even more difficult. Around 59% of households nationally could not afford a diet that met nutrient needs. And as we can see, it's not exactly the same. There are some areas where before we found that a large portion of the people could meet their energy only needs, but when we think about nutrients, a lot, a lot of them couldn't meet this. And this is because the foods required to meet nutrient needs are often a lot less available, a lot more expensive. So in addition to thinking about the household, we really try and consider the different individuals, particularly the individuals um, that, are, uh, that we focus on with related to 1,000 days. And this is an example from Cambodia, but something that we've found to be true in pretty much every country that we've looked at, that the adolescent girl and the lactating woman are the most expensive household members to meet the nutrient needs of. And this means that for them, it is the most difficult for them to meet their nutrient needs. In fact, we know due to inter-household sharing that it's probably not very likely that these people get to meet, get the diet that they need. Now, adolescent girls have very high nutrient needs, as this is the second period of rapid growth. And so for them, they really need a diet that, has, that, that is very high in micronutrients, and also they're not taking in so much energy, so it's very specialized. A lactating woman also has very high specific nutrient needs, because she needs these nutrients for, to produce the breast milk that her child needs to grow healthily. So these kind of, this indication that these two individuals have a very expensive cost within the household indicates that it's probably very likely that these two individuals are not getting their nutrient needs, particularly when we see that affordability for the household is already incredibly difficult. 
Now, this is the modeling that we did for Lau. Now, you can see here that the adolescent girl and women of reproductive age have been displayed. And here we see the cost to meet both of their diets. As we'd seen in the slides before, the adolescent girl and the women of reproductive age had pretty similar costs. Actually, in this case, the adolescent girl had much more expensive costs, but both of them were the two most expensive household members to meet the nutrient needs. Now, just by themselves, a woman of reproductive age and an adolescent girl are expensive to meet the nutrient needs of. However, this becomes even worse or even more difficult, I should say, when they are pregnant or when they're lactating. And you can see that the cost of the diet can go up quite substantially um, when these two are added to the model. So in black, you can see what happens to the diet cost when the girl or the woman becomes pregnant. And in blue, you can see what happens when they're lactating. Now, this is where the secondary data and the linear optimization really kind of speak to each other. In Lao, we found that 40% of women are, were pregnant or already had given birth to their first child by the age of 19. Um, so this is something that they really needed to consider, that, these that they really needed to think about adolescent girls, particularly as their high cost proportion meant that it was probably very unlikely that they were meeting their nutrient needs. And given that the secondary data really showed that te um, teen pregnancy was a huge issue, um, this was a strong point that we were like, this is something that needs to be thought about. Another thing that we found in many of the countries that we're working in is the rising issue of the double burden and an increasing snack culture that we found um, in, in many of the countries. This is an example from Cambodia, where there was a, um, this is a, where a lot of different studies have been conducted that found that there was a lot of high snack food consumption. Um, this, this diagram shows the different studies are about just children under two and the percentage of them eating snack food. Um, and we know if children under two are eating a lot of snack foods, it's highly likely that older children, school-aged children, and adolescents certainly are. Um, and in, in this study, we found a lot, of, or in these different studies, we found that a lot of them were given sugary snacks, potato chips, and cakes. And when we tried to model this into a nutritious diet, we found that snack food consumption could increase the cost of the diet by on average 38%. And we found that like in each of these areas, it really dramatically increased the cost. And what, what does it mean that snack food consumption increases the cost of a nutritious diet? What that means is that it becomes much more difficult for children to meet their nutrient needs. Because in order for them, it's not the snack foods that are really driving the cost up, as these in themselves are pretty cheap. What it means is that in order for them to meet their nutrient needs, they really need foods that are very nutrient dense. As Saskia mentioned earlier, already children under two have very specific needs. Um, and require very specific foods. So once you take into consideration this level of snack food consumption, it becomes increasingly difficult for this child to meet, to meet their needs. So this is an example from Tanzania. And here you can see that minimum acceptable diet was very low across the country. On average, about 9% of children only met a minimum acceptable diet. Um, you can see that minimum meal frequency was much better on the whole than minimum dietary diversity. Um, but minimum dietary diversity across all of the regions was not particularly good. Um, and even the, the best regions showed only about 50% of children meeting a minimum acceptable diet. Now, traditionally, when we see kind of low minimum acceptable diets and low minimum dietary diversity, the traditional response has been really to think about IYCF practices, nutrition education, and things like that. And whilst this is very important, one of the things that we found in Tanzania is the role that affordability plays in accessing a nutritious diet. Um, as we had seen earlier, 59% of households cannot afford a diet that meets nutrient needs. If at the household level you can't afford to meet a diet, um, you can't afford a nutritious diet, it's also highly likely that this is, it's difficult for children to meet their nutrient needs. So we tried different interventions to see how we could improve access and access to nutrients within this context. 
So here are three different regions within Tanzania, and we tried to look at different interventions that were suggested by stakeholders and also that we found within the secondary data to see how we could improve accessibility of a diet. So you see in the kind of light blue bars the cost, the original cost of a nutritious diet, and then what happens when different interventions take place. So the the bars in gray and in dark blue show a kitchen garden intervention. So this is a home gardening intervention where different crops are produced at the household. So the gray is a micronutrient poor garden. This was cabbage, beans, and tomato that was grown. And the kitchen garden in blue is a micronutrient rich garden, which had iron fortified beans, orange flesh sweet potato, um, as well as amaranth leaves. And it also included egg production. As you can see, that a kitchen garden which has more micronutrient rich crops and an animal source food had a much better impact at reducing the cost of the diet. It reduced the cost of the diet by 34% compared to the kitchen garden, which only reduced costs by 7%. We also looked at um, different interventions targeted directly at the child. So a micronutrient powder and a fortified peanut spread, which is small quantity um, lipid-based nutrient supplement. And these also had a great impact in reducing the cost. In fact, of all of these interventions, the small quantity LNS was the most effective, reducing the cost of the diet of the child by 50%. Now, something to bear in mind as well with the kitchen garden is these household interventions are targeted at everyone. So we cannot be sure of what portion of this the child will get. Um, so that's something to also bear in mind when we think about these interventions. In addition to thinking about the child, we also look at other members of the household. We've already mentioned the high cost of a lactating woman. So this is an example from Lao where we modeled different types of interventions to see how we could improve their access to nutrients. So here we looked at different interventions, including a multi-micronutrient tablet, Nutributter, an iron and phospholic acid supplement, energy bars, which is a local, uh, a local specialized food that they produce in Laos. Um, which is fortified with some nutrients, and a fresh food voucher. This includes the fresh vegetables as well as some animal source food like eggs and fish. And we looked at the impact that this had on five different regions in Laos, and we found that it was different according to which region you were in. And here you can see that most of the things that we've modeled, we've looked at in kind. However, when we do look at these different interventions, we don't only look at things in kind. We look at things available on the market, and we also look at things at subsidized cost. However, in order to just see if all things were equal, what kind of impact these could have, we've displayed only what was given in kind. And we see here that multi-micronutrient tablets given in kind were the most effective in reducing the cost of a nutritious diet in Uraman Chai, which is ODX, Sikon, and Savannakat. However, in, in Pongsili, we found that nutri butter was the most effective. And also, we found that fresh food vouchers were very, very effective in Vientiane Capital. So this depends on, in each area, on what are the types of foods available and what are the costs of these foods in each of these areas. So once we look at each of the individuals, we try and look at these different nutrition-specific and sensitive packages and how this could improve affordability um, to a nutritious diet. We look at interventions at, for the general population, as well as for specific target groups, such as the lactating woman, the adolescent girl, and the child under two. And we lo also look at interventions that try and increase the income for the poorest. This could be through kind of cash transfers, or it could be through other types of interventions that increase income. So this is an example from Tanzania, looking at different packages to improve affordability. This could be any range of different packages, and we've just chosen an example to show what could potentially be done to improve affordability. So the black bars shows the percentage of households that could originally not afford a nutritious diet. In some areas, this is particularly high. You see in Dodoma and Rukwa, 68% or to 67% of households can't afford a nutritious diet. However, once we introduce a fortified staple, on the market, such as maize, we see that these costs reduce. In Rukwa, this is particularly effective, where it reduces from 67 to 
Again, we looked at kitchen, different kitchen garden interventions or homestead gardening. And the bars in gray show you the decrease in, afford, in the percentage of households that cannot afford a diet when you introduce a kitchen garden with micronutrient rich crops um, and animal, small animal rearing. We also looked at the impact of um, targeted interventions, interventions targeted at the lactating woman, the adolescent girl, and the child under two have on overall affordability. And this is the, uh, this is the kind of fourth bar along. Um, and you see that these are some of the most effective interventions at reducing household affordability, non-affordability. Like in Rook work goes from 67% of households that cannot afford down to 40%. But when this is combined, when these targeted interventions are combined um, with fortified staples, we can see that these was the most effective in, re in improving non-affordability. When we combine these with cash transfers, we can see that non-affordability improves even further. Cash transfers alone, we found reduced non-affordability from 11 to 16 percentage points. And when these were combined with specific interventions, so we're talking about the targeted interventions at each of the individuals, which is a multi-micronutrient tablet for the lactating woman and the adolescent girl, um, a small quantity LNS for the child under two, and fortified staples provided to the household at market price. Um, we found this combination of interventions combined with a cash transfer could reduce the uh, non-affordability of a nutritious diet by 12 to 46 percentage points. Now, this in itself doesn't have to be a cash transfer. We can, we, we've called it a cash transfer, but in itself, it could be any kind of intervention that improves economic access. So some kind of income generation activity, et cetera. Um, and some of the assumptions that we, we have placed when, when modeling this is that all of the cash provided is used to buy food um, and that the cash transfer is provided to all households that cannot afford a nutritious diet. Whilst we know that this may not always be the case, and certainly it won't be in a lot of instances, it's just to give you an indication of if we do these types of interventions, the impact that this could have on improving access to nutrients. Now I'm going to hand back over to Saskia. Thank you very much, uh, Indira. Yeah, what we'll uh, do now is that we'll share an example of key findings from uh, Lao. So as you've seen from Indira's presentation, um, there is a substantial amount of information that comes from cost of the diet analysis, um, but there's also a substantial amount of information from the secondary data. One example was the um, data on snack foods from Cambodia. Uh, when we do this uh, analysis, we typically end up with uh, a, a long report um, and a slide uh, deck uh, with the um, analysis by topic, which can be like uh, 120 uh, slides uh, for the different topics, triangulating the, the different sources of information, uh, including a cost of diet analysis uh, designed as per um, the stakeholders' uh, interest. Um, and now this, this example shows you uh, the key findings uh, condensed uh, for Lao. So there are eight uh, messages here. Uh, the first one is that child malnutrition varies by geographic location, by ethno-linguistic group, um, and by socioeconomic factors. Uh, often, of course, we also find uh, urban-rural differences to be substantial. Uh, the second message um, is really about the, can you give us the second one? Uh, it's about the quality uh, of the diet being of greater concern uh, than the quantity. Uh, so meeting energy needs um, is much easier than meeting um, much larger uh, nutrient needs, um, and especially by the different uh, members of the household. Um, the third message um, for Lao really found that the sourcing of food is changing. Uh, due to decreasing access to land and forest. There was a lot of, uh, or there is still a lot of uh, foraging uh, going on for uh, plant source foods and, and animal source foods, uh, but with decreasing access that's declining. Um, and that there's also shifts in agricultural production. Uh, so the fourth message, as we 
uh, found, um, again, we showed you for uh, Tanzania, similarly in, uh, in Laos, um, economic access is a key barrier to being able to access a nutritious diet. Um, and in the case of Laos, where some foods were sourced for free from the forest, uh, with decreasing access, um, that possibility is actually declining. Um, so unless uh, incomes improve, access to nutritious foods uh, may decline further. Uh, then uh, message number five on the next slide. Um, there, in addition to um, economic access being an issue, there is also uh, behavioral issues um, with suboptimal breastfeeding practices and complementary feeding. Um, so really the issue needs to be tackled from um, a systems point of view in terms of uh, availability prices and affordability of foods, as well as uh, making best new uh, opportunities uh, and the choices that households uh, have. Um, message six um, was about the, the poor nutrition uh, among women. Uh, we showed you, for example, the analysis of the uh, adolescent girls, the lactating women. So also in Laos, um, unaffordability was uh, a key cause of uh, poor nutrition, uh, but also adolescent pregnancies, a high prevalence of that, um, as Indira showed. Uh, furthermore, gender inequalities, um, as well as some local dietary practices um, about uh, taboo foods and also intra-household sharing of foods, uh, which is not um, favor uh, women. And this, of course, also affects uh, child malnutrition. So sharing these findings uh, with stakeholders from uh, different sectors uh, was really uh, good to make them yeah, realize uh, what the different causes are uh, and also to then identify the different causes that they could address from um, their uh, area of work. Um, message number seven um, was really about uh, the fact that an integrated package uh, is required uh, where nutritious foods uh, are made more affordable, so lower prices. Uh, foods that are processed are more nutritious, so fortifying them in, uh, in a good way, um, and also uh, increasing purchasing power through a cash transfer or other means of generating income. And last but not least um, is maintaining and extending the high level political commitment. Um, the Sun structure was uh, well set up uh, in Laos, um, and it was realized that uh, um, execution at lower level uh, really needed further uh, further work um, and particularly uh, capacity development. Um, so from these uh, key findings and the sharing of the slides, uh, we go to um, a formulation of recommendations. And that's really uh, the stakeholders in country now formulating that. Um, and we're showing you some key recommendations, but we'll keep it short. Um, but really, it's the, the sectors uh, such as uh, social protection, health, uh, agriculture, um, different players involved in the, in the food value chain, and notably the private sector, um, as well as education. So all these sectors, they can implement nutrition-specific and sensitive actions. And um, if you go to the next slide, we'll give you uh, some examples. For example, from the social protection sector and the key points that they have taken, uh, taken away and recommendations that they've uh, made based on this in different countries. Um, so for one, um, you know, this analysis informs uh, looking at the transfer value by realizing uh, how large the gap is uh, of the cost of a nutritious diet to actual um, household expenditure on food. Um, and it also uh, enables an assessment of um, what proportion of the population actually has a gap. Uh, it's not that the full gap uh, is the full cost of the nutritious diet, but it's the, the difference between what they're actually spending and what they should be able to spend. Um, then um, to ensure that the specific target groups meet their nutrient requirement in a most cost-efficient way, um, including uh, in the case of uh, children 6 to 23 months, 
a fortified infantry um, was realized to be a very cost efficient way um, and especially in, um, in Indonesia and El Salvador uh, this was recommended for inclusion uh, and we're talking here uh, 20 gram per day so about uh, 100 kilocalories to complement uh, the diet of the child that is uh, also consisting of breast milk and family foods. Um, another component, of course, is uh, nutrition education, uh, social behavior change, uh, and finding good opportunities to deliver that, so to really make the social safety net more nutrition sensitive also in that way. Uh, and for example, adding a conditionality to the social safety net transfer that is such as uh, attending antenatal care or attending uh, child health days. Uh, the next slide, uh, some examples from health. Um, for one, a discussion on uh, whether multivitamin tablets could replace um, iron folic acid tablets in order to close the nutrient gap uh, for more uh, nutrients. Um, another one um, is that the, besides treatment of moderate acute malnutrition, that there should be more focus on prevention of undernutrition which would also um, have an effect on uh, reducing the incidence of moderate acute malnutrition and, of course, severe acute malnutrition. Um, then on the next slide, some examples from agriculture. Uh, one is the introduction of biofortified crops, uh, ensuring that agriculture extension workers can speak to the importance of good nutrition um, and, of course, reducing post-harvest losses and improving access to markets. Now, from those examples, you may think that um, most of them you may have heard before. Um, the strength of the field nutrient gap analysis is really that uh, those actions that are most relevant to the specific context are identified and that it's done uh, really by having multiple um, stakeholders around the same table from the different sectors so that together um, they, sh they see the, the issues, they share the understanding, and they identify uh, what their priorities and what their possibilities uh, are. And often there is also, um, you know, actions are identified for the short term, the medium term, and the long term, and some for policy and some uh, for programs. So that is really what the uh, filter region gap analysis is about. Uh, we can go very quickly to the food value chain examples. And I'll, we'll just leave them on the screen for a, a little bit. But it's really to bring in um, also the private sector partners um, so that they see where their role uh, can be stronger. Um, and also to link public and private sector together so that public sector should uh, define um, what is required and be informed by public by pro, sorry public sector should define what's required but be informed by what the private sector can deliver um, and that should really uh, go hand in hand so the analysis also helps with that uh, dialogue and formulating next steps um, and on the next slide education is of course also a key um, sector uh, and the focus on uh, on adolescents from the analysis, for example, has been very informative um, also in the, in a number of the countries where the analysis was done. So we like to leave it here with this example. Um, I'll hand it back to uh, Nicola. Uh, and I think we should then go into uh, the questions that I've seen come through uh, as we are presenting. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Saskia and Indira, for a, a great presentation. I think uh, I think it's clear from the presentation that fill the nutrient gap does indeed fill an important gap uh, in nutrition, and bringing together both the nutrition specific and the nutrition sensitive um, areas. Um, providing a, clearly a framework, analytical tool, and most importantly, I think a process uh, that brings together sectors and partners um, to get the evidence and make important uh, decisions for nutrition. And I think what you have in your last slides, uh, uh, the concrete actions that are taken uh, after using the FNG, I think, are, are very clear about the, the importance of the tool in, in informing uh, nutrition programming. So thanks a lot for that. Indeed, uh, we have a little bit over half an hour, and uh, I wanted to thank all the participants because we have quite many questions, so thanks for your active participation. 
Um, we'll try to take them all, and we'll see at the end of the uh, of the, the, the half hour uh, if we have not managed how we, we deal with that. But first question um, that we received, and I'm, I'm turning to you, Saskia. So the the, the question we receive uh, is which foods are contributing to the food price data? Um, is it only staple foods or everything including fruits and vegetables and animal products? Um, and is this the same for each country or is this decided on the food availability? Yeah, That's thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, George, for that question. And, um, the analysis is most informative when we have data on as many foods uh, as possible. Uh, we do require that there's uh, price data on uh, staple foods, on vegetables, on fruits, uh, on animal source foods, distinguishing uh, you know, dairy, uh, meat, fish, eggs. Um, fortified. Of course, we are on the price data that are available or the price data that are collected. Um, if we ex when we explore uh, what the available um, data are, uh, our criteria to accept or not accept uh, them for this analysis um, is that they should have at least 60 to 80 uh, food items, and that that should have a good spread across uh, those different um, subcategories that I uh, just mentioned. And if such is not available, if the food list from food price monitoring or from um, household expenditure surveys or other sources is too narrow, um, then we have to decide to actually collect uh, food price data. And in that, um, you know, we, we do the same, um, but actually we, we have uh, usually many more foods uh, in such a list. So the, the list depends on what the country has available uh, and what we may decide to, uh, to have to collect, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. Very clear. Um, second question we have, and I'm turning to Indira, a question from Anne-Marie Meyer. Is there an assumption in the analysis that nutritious foods will be distributed according to the needs of individuals, for example, that nutritious uh, iron-rich foods go to young children? So when we try and look at the cost of a nutritious diet, we, it optimizes according to the individual. Is there an echo? It, it optimizes according to the cost. Um, it optimizes to the individual nutrient needs. So it looks at what each individual within our household, so a child under two, a lactating woman, a man, et cetera, at each of their individual needs and looks at the cheapest possible um, combination that can fulfill those needs. Now we know in reality, foods are not exactly shared in this way, but what we try and do is work out if they can afford this optimal diet. And if we see in, for example, in the case in Tanzania, where we found 59% of households could not afford this optimal diet, then we know that we're very likely to have a problem in terms of access to nutrients. Thank you, Indira. Um, next question from Masayo, and I'm turning to Saskia for that question. For the analysis of nutrient intake, in identifying the nutritional values of local food items is important to address local food-based approaches. However, uh, Maya, Masayo said, I have seen many countries that do not have appropriate food composition table or database, which include local indigenous food items. This issue is critical to avoid misleading guidance that could be made by linear programming tools such as cost of diet. What do you think? And, and that, uh, I think it came in several places, the issue of, of the food consumption table. So Saskia, if you could uh, help address that question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, of course, the uh, food composition data are uh, very key to this uh, linear programming with cost of the diet. Um, and uh, the tool from Save the Children includes uh, information about, uh, 3, 000, of about 3,000 different foods. Um, and they've compiled this from uh, different food composition uh, tables. 
So when we try to match uh, foods locally available to foods um, available in the software with their uh, nutrient content, uh, we select the foods uh, that are the, the same foods or that are most like those foods. So there is, uh, for example, food composition for data from Ghana, from Bangladesh. So there is some uh, regional uh, variation uh, in there, regional sources in there. Um, so that's uh, how it's done. Um, of course, uh, if data are available uh, on specific local foods, those can also be used. Uh, one critical thing there is that, the, um, as Indira mentioned, the cost of the diet has information about nine uh, minerals, uh, uh, sorry, nine vitamins, four minerals, uh, and of course, fat, protein, and, um, and energy. Um, so if we're using data from another food composition table, it should have data on all those nutrients um, in order to avoid uh, blanks. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. Very clear. Uh, next question uh, to Indira from uh, Gwyneth Scott at Spring. How did you determine the nutrient needs for adolescent girls? Are there any guidelines available for specific nutrient needs, or is this based on just the energy needs for this age group uh, and pregnancy or lactation? Indira. So the nutrient needs are based on the WHO recommended nutrient intakes for a girl of this age group. Um, and then it was adjusted again according to if they were, became pregnant or were lactating. Thank you. Uh, stay on, Indira, please, for the next question from uh, Anna, our colleague, Anna Bekele. Uh, Indira, were you able to model the cost of diet for breastfed and breastfed children separately? Uh, if so, how, may, how different is it, or is it the cost is or is the cost the same? The cost of breastfed and non-breastfed children. Right. So actually, this is a modelling that we did in several countries um, to show act the economic benefits of breastfeeding. And this was actually a very interesting analysis where we found the cost of the diet of a non-breastfed child increased substantially. In some places, it even doubled. Um, so. In, in the case of the general model, we've tried to model optimal breast milk intake because that's what we would suggest. Um, however, we can see in the cases where this, this isn't happening, which is most places, you can see that the costs go up, again, making it more difficult for these kids to meet their nutrient needs. Thank you. Thank you, Indira. Um, we have a question from our colleague uh, Jennifer Nielsen uh, regarding the, the point, the, 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 um, the facts and the findings in Tanzania, and I'm, I'm turning to Saskia. Um, what was shown in Tanzania is, is rather discouraging, um, looking at the size of the gap that remains, even with all the interventions that are being uh, implemented, uh, and without even addressing the uh, infection causes. So, Saskia, what, what do you suggest for such challenge? What, what, what can we do? Well, it uh, depends how, uh, you know, we should set a, a goal that's informed by the actual challenges. Um, so really uh, what we do through this assessment is to identify, yeah, what is the actual size of the gap? What was it caused by? And what are the most cost efficient uh, ways and using existing platforms uh, that we have to reach as many people as possible um, with better options? Um, you know, as we look at the progress on uh, addressing malnutrition over several decades, we see progress, but we also see that it, uh, it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't take uh, one or two key interventions. It really needs um, different things to come together, uh, economic development, uh, more diversified agriculture and so on. So this really should help uh, to focus the actions on um, those aspects that are within reach and that will have uh, the most impact. So it should help to, to tailor where we're going uh, in a specific country and it should not uh, sort of discourage by being too overwhelming in the sense of, wow, the needs are so large and, and we can't fix this uh, within the next uh, three, five, three or five years. Uh, but it should really help to identify where to focus best, you know, where can we best invest. Thanks. 
Thank you, Saskia. And I, I like your point on looking at uh, existing platforms and in that looking at you know efficiencies in in scaling up through already existing platforms. Um, Indira, one next question to you from uh, Dorothy Mituki. Uh, where the intervention selected through a participatory approach with community members or from best practices from literature? Um, as Saskia mentioned, this, the kind of stakeholder engagement is a really key part of Fill the Nutrient Gap. So all of the interventions modeled came through consultations with stakeholders. Of course, we tried to make sure that there's an evidence base for using these interventions, but it was really about through stakeholder collaboration that we identified them. Thanks a lot, India. Very, very important point here. Um, next to you, Saskia, questions from Dr. Darren Hughes. Um, how these findings are fed back to policymakers to ensure they take action? What is the process and how successful have you been in using this excellent evidence to engage the private sector? Important point. Thanks for that question on private sector engagement. Over to you, Saskia. Yeah, a question. Uh yeah, so, um, yeah, throughout the process, the stakeholders are involved. And so, uh, we typically have a, a smaller group of more technically inclined uh, people from stakeholders who verify um, with us that the analysis is comprehensive, that we have included the key uh, information sources, um, and that the triangulation of that yeah, makes, makes good sense. Um, and then uh, those findings are shared back with uh, the key stakeholders, including uh, policy makers. Um, now that is just uh, the moment of sharing them um, and then the formulation of recommendations. And then after that, uh, there needs to be an ongoing process uh, where these findings are brought to the table um, at all relevant uh, discussion points. Um, so starting the process in country is really about bringing the right um, stakeholders and at the right level uh, on board at the beginning um, so that they are aware and interested and willing to, to contribute to the process and then looking forward to the findings so that they can use those uh, yeah, going going forward. Um, so the experience is that it really uh, yeah, depends on how the country processes are organized, uh, what the best process um, is. Um, and um, involvement of the private sector, um, it's really nice if that can be done through uh, the Sun Business Network, if that is um, active in country. Uh, but there can also be um, you know, other uh, ways of uh, having the private sector uh, represented um, in the process and also to, with the findings of the analysis, engage uh, the private sector. So the process of the F&G analysis and its immediate dissemination is one, um, but then also the, the next steps of using those to, to engage the different stakeholders on, on next steps and on sharing, hey, I, you weren't at the meeting, but look, this is what uh, what came out. Here is the the summary. Have have a read, and you know, let's uh, let's discuss on on what you can do. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Saskia, and I think thanks to take it back also to um, the, the Sun Movement. You know, the opportunity presents uh, when we have a Sun country that is organised around the networks, and and the opportunity it, it you know it is to bring. Uh, the different partners together around the, the, the network. Thanks for that. Uh, next question to Indira from uh, Stefan Kodish. Indira, could you please clarify how you reconcile different household food insecurity, nutritional status, food price findings across all of the various data sources in any one country and across seasons? That's a loaded question. Uh, or do you, uh, or do certain secondary sources hold more weight and are more trusted than others? Indira. Um, that's a good question. So yeah, what we try and do is we really try and look at the methodology of our sources to really make sure that they are valid and trusted and how much we can really infer from them. 
Um, and once we are kind of sure, sure about this, we then try and look at how they speak to each other and what we can say, what are the kind of synergies between the two um, and try and triangulate the information so we can understand what the interrelationship is between each of these sources. Thank you. Thank you, Indira. Next uh, to Saskia uh, from Saira Khan. Uh, Saskia, how do we convey to key stakeholders, especially government, of the, uh, these immediate and medium-term benefits of engaging in this process in order to get them on board? So engagement here with stakeholders, in particular uh, government. Over to you, Saskia. Yeah, thank you, uh, Saira. Uh, this, um, the way we typically do it um, is by, uh, you know, such as this webinar to share um, some findings that we have had from uh, from other countries um, to yeah to gauge their interest in the in the topic and to also uh, make the key stakeholders realize that yeah of nutritious food is really important. Uh, affordability of nutritious food can be a key issue um, and there's actually different data sources available in country that may not have been um, looked at so much um, to date that can actually uh, really be, be looked at. So it's, yeah, it depends on uh, who the key uh, stakeholders in government are that need to be brought on board. Um, but when you engage in a discussion on uh, nutrition sensitive um, actions, you know, needing to uh, to do more on that and, and how to engage them, that is, yeah, that should inform uh, or inform which components of the analysis uh, you can bring forward uh, best. Um, you know, when we do the, the cost of diet analysis and we come with those uh, those numbers and, and proportions and um, we often come with new information and it's information that uh, we find to be really of interest to uh, to people that are, uh, you know, in, in economics, in finance, uh, those types of numbers uh, speak to them. Um, and it's similar like with the a cost of hunger uh, analysis, when you start to, to quantify impact of malnutrition on development or now, um, you know, actually the affordability issue and that that can inform where to take action or how to look at your uh, transfer from the social safety net, that, that is, yeah, often sparking their, their interest and then uh, their engagement. Um, so maybe have them uh, listen to the webinar recording or share some things in print um, that may help to uh, to raise their interest. Thanks, Askan. Indeed, like you said, the, the webinar is recorded and uh, available to everyone uh, after the, the, the session. Um, next one uh, to Indira. Um, from uh, Georg Litze. Uh, how are the seasonal effects taken into account and their effects on pricing? So we do this in two ways. Um, sometimes we have price data from different seasons, so we can model the impact that seasonal price changes have on the cost of a diet. If we don't have this, however, we try to look at kind of different pieces of secondary information we have to contextualize what we think will happen and have some sort of estimations of what we think, how seasonality could affect the analysis. Thanks, thanks. Uh, good, good, uh, good point here. Uh, next one to Saskia from uh, Anne-Marie Mayer. Uh, Saskia, what about traditional and indigenous agricultural practices and foods to make up the shortfall in nutrients? Not just home gardens, but field crop choices as well as, well as such as millet, etc. What, uh, what do you think? Yeah, thank you. The cost of diet analysis uh, does include, um, you know, anything that is that actually can have uh, a price. Um, so the traditional and indigenous foods, um, they will be um, in the in the software to choose uh, as a way of composing the the, the nutritious, least uh, costly uh, diet. Um, and when we do modeling, um, if those foods are already included um, in the choices, um, we may also 
look at making some foods available for um, a lower price uh, or for free, where we would imagine, uh, for example, a voucher uh, distribution with which people can um, obtain certain foods for free. Um, and in such modeling, uh, we would, of course, uh, model the most nutrient-dense uh, foods. So there is a way of um, looking at what if uh, those nutritious foods uh, that are actually uh, locally available, locally grown or locally gathered, um, if they became uh, more affordable, you know, what proportion of the needs could they, could they meet? Um, and what does that mean for the cost to the household of those, um, yeah, those possible actions? So it's not only uh, field crops, but it's basically anything um, yeah, locally available and uh, for which we can have a price to, to include and for which we can model a different price to include. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saskia. Um, we have um, follow-up questions to the seasonality question in there, and I'm turning again back to you uh, from Georg. Um, uh, seasonality can also affect food availability, as some foods like mangoes in Tanzania are only available at certain times. Is, that, is this somewhat also taken into account? Yeah, sorry, that's a good point. Um, availability does greatly impact the cost of the diet and we do try and take that into account where we have data possible. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that and clarification, Indira. So, next question to Saskia. Uh, when uh, calculating the cost of a diet using the, a kitchen garden, was the cost of the inputs for the garden including in the calculation? Saskia, to you. A question from Lad. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good uh, question and it actually uh, applies to, to all the, the modeling, so I'll answer it a bit more uh, broader. Um, the analysis as we do them, uh, they look at the cost to the household. So it basically looks at the, their access uh, to an adequately nutritious diet. Um, what we are assuming with that is that someone, a uh, public sector typically, will provide um, that intervention. Um, now, costing of interventions uh, to that public sector uh, provider um, is the next step um, that can be done. So, no, uh, we don't look um, at the cost of actually providing the intervention, uh, which can, of course, also be a cost to the household, if the household is the one uh, with the, the homestead garden and, uh, and producing that. So it's, uh, the modeling just goes as far as the cost to the household of um, obtaining um, a nutritious foods that complement uh, the intervention that is provided. Um, and as we do that, uh, we may include the intervention for free. We may include the intervention for like uh, half price, so some sort of subsidy. Um, and we can also model um, an intervention, uh, for example, uh, fortified flour or fortified oil uh, or fortified rice uh, being in the market at a certain price. Um, and then in that price, yeah, we assume uh, that it's a realistic uh, price, so then actually the costs are included. But any modeling uh, for free or with a subsidy needs to be paid by um, by a source. So that's not, not part of the field of nutrient gap, but it's a next step uh, that can then uh, be done. So this is really to inform um, you know, a comparison of different interventions what it means to the household's access to uh, required nutrients. Thank you, Saskia. Um, a questions on, on tool. I think we have two questions on tools and modeling. Uh, first to uh, Saskia, and then the second to Indira. Saskia, question from Anna, Anna Bekele. Is cost of diet software much different from OptiFood tool? Um, and can you please explain the difference? Yeah, no, many thanks for that question. Uh, they're both uh, linear programming-based tools. Um, so they calculate a, a solution for uh, the problem uh, presented. 
what the OptiFood does. Um, for OptiFood, you require data uh, on actual uh, nutrient intake uh, by specific uh, by your target group of interest. So let's say uh, you're interested in children between uh, six and 12 months of age. Um, you use 24-hour recall data from them, um, and then you let the tool uh, select a diet that meets their requirements, selecting from the portion sizes that they have, the foods that they use, um, and also um, you only include foods that are consumed uh, with a certain frequency. Um, and the, the aim of that analysis is to formulate food-based dietary guidelines such that uh, the specific target group can meet their nutrient needs as good as possible. Um, so it is well possible that those guidelines uh, will not meet all the needs, uh, but it will meet them to the, to the greatest extent possible, given the local context, which does include um, that, that, that the choices are limited to households. Um, Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah. The cost of it. Oh, sorry, with the cost of uh, assessing the proportion of affordability and, and non-affordability for uh, a household consisting of different members, but it's not uh, to formulate dietary guidance, uh, which is actually uh, um, the prime aim of OptiFood. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Saskia, very clear. Back to India on the modeling questions uh, from uh, Georg. Morbidity information. Uh, um, is morbidity information also taken into account for the modeling? Uh, infection could increase the need for certain nutrients, for example. How do you factor that uh, into the modeling? Over to you, Indira. That's an interesting question. Um, we don't currently take that into account. We model for recommended nutrient intake. However, if there was a demand to do that, we could model that. So we could model if someone had increased nutrient needs, what impact that would have. However, we're trying to sort of generalize over a population. So currently, we just use normal RNI. OK. Um, next question, um, also from, from Georg, um, to Saskia. Saskia, uh, for the peanut spread, did you check the coverage into rural households as well? I would assume that rural households will struggle to get this information. Does your analysis take rural versus urban into account? Is that to Saskia? Fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, yeah so what we do with the, uh, with the modeling and the analysis, they're all uh, kind of what-if um, scenarios. So in this case, uh, stakeholders said, well, is this some, is providing a uh, fortified peanut spread or a small quantity LNS, is that, is that a good way of, uh, for, is that a good thing for us to do? Um, so then we model it to show uh, to what extent that already takes care of the nutrient requirements and what the costs are then to complement it. Um, and that, when that then comes out, um, as a very cost-efficient way, then uh, stakeholders can, uh, based on that, sit together and decide, well, if that's so cost-effective, is there actually, how could we actually do that? Um, so, no, uh, that is not yet taken into account, but it is clearly, of course, something highly relevant. Uh, who could you reach with such an intervention? Thank you, Saskia. Um, one more question, uh, and I'm turning to Indira uh, from uh, Ejin Kim. For the food price data, does FNG require the data collection of the price of snack as well? In, in our typical nutritious diets, we don't include snack foods within the model. But for the snack food model, yes, we looked, we modeled it with the cost of the snack food um, in order to see the impact that this would have. But as I mentioned, these snack foods were, were very cheap, and the way in which they increased prices was really to do with how it made it more difficult for the child to meet its nutrient needs without um, exceeding the energy thresholds. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Indira. Uh, I think, I believe we have exhausted all the questions we received, and it's quite uh, many questions, so I want to thank again the participants for the active participation. Um, just to, before handing over back to Aaron, uh, just to um, thank our uh, presenters. Uh, I forgot one question. Sorry, Lina. Okay, one question. Sorry, yes, uh, it's there. So we will take uh, Lina's question, and I'm turning to Saskia. Uh, apologies, Lina, for that oversight. So uh, question to you, Saskia. Uh, it was mentioned that lactating mother's diet is most costly. Um, did you take into account that those mother's cost include the cost of her exclusive breastfeeding child, and was this deducted? I hope uh, the question is clear. Yeah, thanks, Lina. Um, so what we do for the modeling, we use the nutrient requirements as uh, per the uh, FAO, WHO, uh, RNI. Um, and that for the uh, woman who's, breast, who's lactating um, means the nutrient needs that are required to, uh, for her uh, because of her producing the, the breast milk. So in a way, uh, the cost of her breastfed child go through uh, the woman, but that's also because she is the one that needs to consume the food with those nutrients in order to um, yeah to have to, to produce the breast milk. Nicola, I see one more question in the in the list and that is uh, what the uh, fill the nutrient gap analysis cost. Can I take that one as well? Please please go ahead, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, the cost um, are Typically, uh, around uh, 100,000 uh, US dollars uh, when secondary food price data can be used, um, and they are around 150,000 uh, when we should also collect uh, food price data from markets. Um, now, these costs, uh, of course, they depend on uh, how elaborate the analysis uh, will be, what the costs in country uh, are. Uh, but these are the, the rough indications. Perfect. Thank you, Saskia, for, for this addition. I think we've covered all the questions. Uh, I want to thank, thank all the participants for their active participation. I want to thank uh, Saskia and Indira for the presentation and the, and the, and the time taking all the questions. Uh, I want to remind you all that uh, the um, presentation, the webinar has been recorded, and so you will be able to access that through the Secure Nutrition uh, website as well as the slides. And I want to also just mention to you that as part of the series of webinars through the UN network, we will be announcing shortly our next uh, webinar that normally will be in about two months' time. We, we've agreed with colleagues in Secure Nutrition that uh, of a frequency of about two every two months. So stay tuned for the next webinar and thanking you again uh, for your active participation. Goodbye. And just, yeah, one last point. Uh, French um, session tomorrow on the same uh, uh, Field and Trend Gap webinar and the day after in Spanish. So uh, we are completing the three languages. Thank you very much again and, and goodbye.